to Next Round with the Pacific Research Institute. I'm your host, Romina Itchon. Last week, Governor Newsom came out with his new revised budget. Because of the forced shutdown of California businesses and additional spending on the coronavirus pandemic, the governor expects a $54 billion shortfall. Our all-star panel of experts examines the governor's new budget and what Californians can expect in the coming months. We have Tim Anaya, PRI Senior Director of Communications, Lance Zumi, Senior Director of Education Studies, Carrie Jackson, Fellow in California Studies, and Wayne Weingarten, Senior Fellow in Business and Economics. Thanks for joining us. Well, welcome back, All-Star California panel. So last week, Governor Newsom came out with a revised budget projecting a $54 billion budget deficit. So his original budget proposal back in January totaled $222 billion, and now it's been scaled back to $203 billion. Uh, California is required, thankfully, by its constitution to balance the budget. Newsom projects that California's revenues will fall about $41 billion, and the rest of the gap is from additional coronavirus spending. So we're going to spend some time here examining parts of the budget with all of our experts. And as, as far as closing the budget cap, uh, Newsom is no doubt hoping to get federal money, and Nancy Pelosi's Heroes Bill sets aside about $900 billion to state and local governments. And, and according to the Tax Foundation, California is going to get about $20 billion for the state and uh, about $54 billion for localities. Uh, obviously, Newsom is not likely to get everything he wants if McConnell has its his say. Tim, you've been around the block. Um, Newsom's got this uh, uh, plan to have these trigger cuts. You've seen this before with Governor Brown. Tell us a little bit about that and how that works. Governor Newsom channeled his uh, inner Jerry Brown for some of his budget strategies this year, although we didn't hear him talking about subsidiarity or irrational exuberance like Jerry Brown would say. But basically, trigger cuts are a... Uh, maybe a politically safe way for a governor to propose major cuts, but he doesn't, quote, own them. So back in 2011, when Jerry Brown came in as governor for his second stint, remember we were still kind of dealing with the aftermath of the Great Recession, and the state had a big budget mess that we were still uh, cleaning up then. Governor Brown knew that we had to either get more tax revenue into the state or we'd have to make continued significant cuts. What he devised was a proposal to give Californians a choice. So he proposed what he called trigger cuts. And these are cuts that would trigger if something doesn't happen. So in that case, uh, Brown proposed that if Californians didn't propose a a massive tax increase, which was um, later uh, on the ballot as Prop 30, then significant many billion dollars of cuts to K-12 through and higher education education would take place. So he basically made uh, Californians choose. Do you want to have massive cuts to education or do you want to go for quote unquote temporary tax increases? And ultimately, in that case, the voters approved Prop 30 and those cuts were not triggered. Now, in Newsom's case, he's proposed about $14 billion in trigger cuts and those cuts, and it's across the board, it's on education, child care, preschool, arts, all you know, priorities across the board. And what he's basically doing is setting up Trump as the boogeyman on this one. So if the president does not agree to, quote unquote, Aunt Nancy's proposal for a nearly trillion dollar bailout of of California and other states, then all of these popular uh, programs will face these $14 billion in budget cuts. Now, I predict what's really at play here, since we know California will likely get some sort of additional funding from Washington, but not anywhere near what, you know, Newsom has talked about in his trillion dollar bailout plan that Pelosi is pushing. I think this is setting up ultimately Californians for another push for a tax increase. So when we don't get the money we want from Washington, inevitably, I predict that Newsom is then going to uh, make the the pitch to voters. We're either going to have these uh, trigger cuts or you agree to this, um, you know, massive tax increase to make them uh, make them go away. So it will be interesting to see how it plays out ultimately, but that's in a nutshell how uh, what the trigger cuts are and how they would work. So here's a question for everyone. Uh, what's your main takeaway from the governor's new budget? Wayne, let's start with you. You're, you're our resident economist. 
Well, if you look at the what he's proposed, it, not the politics of it, it's what has to happen, right? He, he's got a, a huge reduction in spending, which is good because we have a huge reduction in income and a huge uh, budget hole. So I, I, I love the idea that he puts trigger cuts dependent upon the president because it's very unlikely he'll get uh, anywhere near the money. Hopefully he'll get none of it. And we'll have to start uh, well, imposing budget discipline on the state. And part of what this game is, which is why I think let him let him cut the spending. That's fantastic. There is places where we could cut that are not nearly as painful as the ones that Governor Newsom keeps targeting. You target the most painful because then you convince, oh, the federal government's got to kick it in or we'll have to raise taxes like Tim was just saying. But uh, just, just one example, there are reports out there that says uh, California taxpayers are paying $3.3 billion more than they have to for the health care costs of employees. So there are savings that we can make that make the government more efficient. And that's what we have to focus on. So uh, by all means, cut spending. I, I agree with, with Wayne on the, the spending cuts. It's kind of shocking as to how much people pay in taxes out here. Yeah, I, and I will give Newsom some credit for the 10% pay cut to state employees. And essentially, what it looks like almost a hiring freeze, except for what are considered essential employees or vacancies. And of course, that, that can always be manipulated. But in some ways, I look at this too, and I go, this is just California business as usual. And that might be a bit cynical, but we we'll go back to what Roe said earlier. I believe it was Roe, maybe it was Tim, but he's looking at this money coming from Congress. Uh, to bail him out of any kind of really hard decisions. And again, as Wayne said, they go for the easy cuts or the cuts that we're going to we're gonna hold these over your head. You're not going to have any schools open and libraries and this sort of thing. So you got to go back and hike taxes uh, where cuts could be made less painfully in other places. And I think that's true of any government at any size anywhere in the world. But I, I just can't get away from this feeling that in some ways uh, it's, it's just California business as usual. And maybe there's a little more seriousness that needs to be in Sacramento that needs to be uh, adopted uh, in this particular crisis. How about you, Lance? Any takeaways? Well, you know, in, in my area of education, Ro, I, and I, I think as in all areas of this budget, I mean, it's important to really have some perspective. And yes, there will be reduction in education spending from what Governor Newsom proposed in his January budget. But even in this May revise, he's proposing around $100 billion in total education spending, which is still a huge one-third more than we were spending just six years ago in 20. 2014. So what's important to point out is that even though the spending has increased by a massive amount, student achievement has actually gone down during that period. I've just written, uh, for example, an article for PRI that during the last half dozen years, based on test scores on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, California's eighth grade math and reading scores have declined substantially. So the fact that, you know, uh, over these past years, California has increased spending has not resulted in what the purpose of that spending was supposed to be for, to increase student achievement. So really, we're talking about numbers now, but if we're looking at the impact of those budget numbers on, you know, the groups that they're supposed to help, there hasn't been a lot of that. Uh, And, uh, you know, that's why I agree also with uh, what Wayne and uh, with Kerry have said about, uh, you know, looking at, you know, where we should be spending uh, our money and uh, reducing it where it's not doing any good. Well, you know, my overall takeaway is that, you know, there's a a lot in this budget that I think has been there, done that, and, and you guys have been around the the legislature in Sacramento know um, that you know there this doesn't seem to be any lessons uh, learned from the the la- and in my case you know I'm I'm talking about uh, uh, these uh, um, furloughed state employees um, that are expected to you know take a 10 percent or so cut in their budget or or take a furlough depending on how um, the unions ne- negotiate but when that happened in the last recession uh, with the furloughs you know before the recession Sacramento was a vibrant, growing city. It was fun to go to Sacramento. And when we had these furloughs, the Sacramento economy just tanked and was late uh, to the recovery and for many years was really in the doldrums. And, you know, I think Lance and I talked about this when I would come out and visit Sacramento. Um, so wouldn't it be better, you know, as a manager, um, for me, wouldn't it be 
better to to lay off a portion of the workforce. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of fat in the bureaucracy. Help those workers move on to to other jobs, even give them a package um, rather than uh, do a mass furlough or pay cuts. And you, you know, in that way, you lose a lot of morale in the workforce. Uh, there's repercussions for the overall Sacramento economy, restaurants, retail, and so forth. Um, even just prolonging the recession uh, even more. So I hope that's not the the way they go. So Tim, you've uh, worked in the legislature in 2008 and 2009, and the last time California faced a budget crisis anywhere close to this magnitude, give us some historical perspective from the budget enacted uh, during the Great Recession. Uh, What are some of the budget tools that lawmakers and and the governor can employ during a a time of crisis to close close what may be historically a, a large budget deficit? Well, as I write on our Right by the Bay blog this week, I was reminded of the old song, Everything Old is New Again. And when you hear Newsom talking about some of the things, you know, that he is employing for this year's budget, um, I certainly have flashbacks to the 2008-09 budget, which was up till now the worst uh, fiscal crisis that the state has faced. It was about $60 billion problem over uh, two years. Um, One of the things that was interesting to see, um, Newsom talked about, look at all the progress that we made over the past decade in uh, paying down a lot of the debt and stuff stopping some of the bad budget policies of the past. We paid down Jerry Brown's infamous wall of debt, uh, which is all the kind of internal borrowing and fund shifts. That's an easy way in a budget crisis to free up some cash and, you know, delay making tough budget choices. Um, There are a lot of other gimmicks, too, that you can employ, putting off spending to the next fiscal year on paper, um, things like that. Well, what did Newsom turn around and do after extolling the virtues of doing all that, then he proposed about $4 billion in new internal borrowing and fund shifts and, you know, all of those gimmicks. So I guess uh, we might be, uh, you know, getting out the masonry and uh, building a new uh, wall of debt here. The other thing that was interesting and something that's happened since the last budget crisis is the Rainy Day Fund. And the Rainy Day Fund was something that my old boss, Connie Conway, took the lead on uh, finally enacting into law in 2014. Basically, the principle of that is saving money in good times to help cushion the blow of budget cuts in bad times. And here we're at that point. We, we've we saved about $16 billion in the rainy day fund reserve. And uh, what was good about the effort that we did back in the day was that there were previous quote unquote rainy day funds, but they were so weak that you basically could raid the money anytime you wanted. This was a more ironclad rainy day fund. And this shows why we need that, because we have this money, and the governor is basically proposing to spend that money over three fiscal years between this rainy day fund and there are a couple of other rainy day funds that Democrats created in recent years for social services programs and then also for education. So we have about $8 billion, a little more than that, that we're going to use from the rainy day fund this year. It's by no means going to alleviate these cuts, but it certainly softens the blow. The irony on all of this is that you see see a Newsom championing the Rainy Day Fund, but Democrats actually fought the Rainy Day Fund tooth and nail for years, uh, and especially, you know, they don't like to have ironclad budget rules that restrict how they can spend money. And so this, you know, actually proved the wisdom of having these kinds of budget rules in place. I was just going to say, you know, talking about history, you know, California's history is, re- is replete with these crises where we have a very progressive tax system. So revenues surge in the good times and in inevitably we spend up, like Lance was saying earlier, right? Uh, revenues and expenditures surge up and then they crash and we have these inevitable crises. It happens in the 90s and the 80s and you know, it's happening again today. And I, I think it's important to make take note of that so we don't get the huge unsustainable, not just revenue surges, but also expenditure service, uh, surges so we can try to tamp down on the volatility of California's budget. Because during the good times, that volatility seems like everything's going well, but during the bad time, the Pain is that much harder because of the way we set up our system. Tim, I was I was going to follow up on your rainy day the the rainy day fund discussion you had, which is why 
why not spend it all this year? Why not spend the whole sixteen billion? Clearly, we're in a crisis situation. Couldn't couldn't the legislature allow him to to uh, spend this money this year? I mean, I look at if, if I were personally managing my own money and I had this this rainy day fund, I would want to spend it all before I even think about borrowing or begging. So it seems to me it would make more sense. Actually, they can't. You're actually limited on how much you can take out of the rainy day fund in any given year. And it's a constitutional amendment. So voters adopted it into the state constitution. So you'd have to go back to the voters to change it. Uh, But basically, the wisdom of that was you're forcing policymakers and budget makers to take a more longer term view when we have a budget shortfall and enact budget choices that are not kind of one time band-aids that are going to be, you know, maybe tough, but longer term solutions to steer us through the crisis. So you have some money to cushion and prevent the most severe cuts. But, um, you know, if we just did that, I would fear it would put off these tough budget choices till next year. And what we've learned from the 2008 budget crisis and the um, 2001 budget crisis is or the earlier you make some some of the courage and make the tough budget choices, the better you are in the long run. Uh, Lance, um, for you, you know, education spending usually takes center stage with the governor's budget announcement. And California's $54 billion deficit means that K-12 through and higher education spending will likely be reduced for the first time in recent memory. So what are your thoughts on the governor's education budget proposal? And what are some areas of current education spending that you would recommend policymakers look at to minimize potential classroom cuts? Well, uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, The way to look at the education budget is not necessarily by this line item versus that line item, because the problem with the way California spends its education dollars is actually systemic. Most education funding is distributed through a system called the local control funding formula, where the state spends tax dollars and sends them to school districts with little accountability for actually for how they actually spend the money. So last year, the state auditor actually issued a report that said, quote, the state's approach to the local control funding formula has not ensured that funding is benefiting intended student groups and closing achievement gaps, unquote. And further, the auditor's report found that the state does not track the way school districts spend state funds, so policymakers lack the adequate information to assess how state funding is affecting student outcomes. So, you know, the problem overall is that the state has got a system of spending and distributing funds that really has, A, no accountability, and and they really don't know where it's going and how it's really affecting the students. And so, you know, this is not, therefore not a, a question where you can just say, oh, if we just change this little program or that little program, things will get, be better. We're talking about how the sp- state is distributing most of its education dollars, and that's the problem uh, that we face. Uh, the other thing that I'd point out is that the state education spending uh, program protects status quo models. So e- and, and even if those models aren't working for all, so let me give you an example. Governor Newsom says that he's protecting special education spending from any cut, but the way special education is funded in California guarantees that students receive only certain types of one-size-fits-all instruction and assistance. As I write in my upcoming book, which I co-authored with a young woman named Mia Giordano, out-of-the-box methods that actually address student needs actually can't get funded in California. That's why I recommend that California fund uh, follows uh, Florida's lead and enact an education savings account program that allows parents to use state dollars to uh, use for education services such as education therapies or tutoring or tuition for private programs. And I think just generally that this money follows the child funding method is a much better method of funding education than the shoveling of tax dollars from one level of government to another. Well, here's a, here's a question for Wayne. Uh, Wayne, you've written a lot about California's nearly $1 trillion unfunded public employee pension obligations. Just as state and local governments were beginning to take baby steps to address the problem, you know, they've been rocked by the coronavirus uh, recession. Uh, Newsom, in his budget plans, uh, plans to delay making payments to, into the pension system. And now with the stock market down, do you see another pension crisis looming? Uh, do you think this could lead to uh, more municipal 
multiple bankruptcies uh, in the year or two ahead. I think, you know, despite their steps, they were never, they were not enough. And so we've had a pension crisis looming and that that the, the chances of that are much higher now. And the how bad it's going to be is going to be much worse. Uh, you, you know, part of the reason the pension liability, we're talking about a trillion dollar liability. You're actually looking at the certainty of all of these payments we have to make compared to the market risk uh, of all the investments. Well, obviously, you know, the market risk has ramped up and depending upon what the recovery will be, and it's, it's very unlikely that we're going to get what they call a V-shaped economic recovery where things just grow very quickly after this steep decline and very, you know, in a very short period of time, we kind of get the economy back to where it was. That's looking less and less likely, which means the stock market, even though it's recovered a, a, a good bit, you know, are we going to see strong growth? Is it going to kind of trend downward? There's there's all sorts of uncertainty and the likelihood, again, that we see strong growth there is, is diminishing, all of which means that as we get closer and closer to when this pension bomb is going to explode, the assets that we have to cover those pensions is going to be less valuable. And that means, yes, we're going to have likelihood of budget crises, municipal bankruptcies, the need for either spending cuts elsewhere or tax increases that aren't going to be affordable. I mean, all of these unpleasant trade-offs, because we won't address that crisis, has all been worsened because of this hopefully once-in-a-generation kind of collapse. Uh, that we've seen in the economy. Kerry, uh, Governor Newsom has uh, suspended many state laws temporarily due to the uh, coronavirus crisis, but he's held firm in enforcing the very controversial new law AB5 on independent contractors. Uh, in fact, the governor is seeking additional funds in the budget to kind of double down on enforcement, in addition to the um, recent uh, announcement of the lawsuit by the attorney general. Wouldn't temporarily suspending this law be a pretty inexpensive way to help people work at home and avoid going on expensive public assistance programs? Yes, absolutely. Of course it would. But it wouldn't only help people who are out of work be able to get out there and earn a paycheck. Uh, it would generate tax revenues, which, you know, this is what this is about. We are having a, a big problem with tax revenues coming in, the $54 billion deficit. So it would certainly <clears throat> help on that level. So I, this is, to me, why it's a little, uh, it's a bit puzzling as to why he's refusing uh, to suspend the law. I, I don't see it as that big of a political risk because so many people hate the law. We've seen the, the protest. Twitter is constantly filled with people criticizing it and being and complaining about being left out of work. We saw a lot of layoffs. So I, I know the unions wouldn't be happy with the suspension, but you know I think they could be mollified with promises of some future favors. I'm not sure they're gaining anything from it right now anyway, given the way the economy is in lockdown. So why not suspend it? You know why not let people you know, earn some money? Um, it, it's it might be the, the simply the single best thing he could do in this crisis. But instead, as you mentioned, he's he's doubled down is a phrase I believe you used to uh, on the law and holding firm, not only holding firm, but he's he wants $22 million uh, to enforce it at a time when there's a, a monstrous record deficit in the state. And that doesn't make sense given how much opposition and how much anger and frustration has been generated by this law. So I, I, I don't, to answer, go back and answer the question, yes, it would do, it might be the single best thing he could possibly do. Uh, why he's doing it, I, I'm not sure. And it's very frustrating. Well, I, I would I'll add in and you know, t- uh, taking off on what Kerry has just said is that, you know, uh, Newsom's response to uh, uh, this law and not suspending it. Now, I just think is like kind of emblematic of the inflexibility that Newsom has shown, you know, throughout this entire crisis, not just Newsom, but uh, but people like Garcetti in L.A. and other places, you know, where it doesn't really matter what the actual suffering of the people are going through, you know, what the, even the science may uh, show, what the uh, statistics and the research and are showing what may be better course of action, it seems as though that Newsom and his other, you know, most government cohorts here in uh, California have chosen paths of inflexible decision making, you know, as opposed to being flexible, which is really what this time calls for. I mean, even the healthcare experts say that uh, we have to be uh, flexible because we don't know all the facts, you know, and we, uh, we've been surprised so many times. So, you know, our leaders should be uh, as flexible as that too. But instead, they respond like Newsom has done by being inflexible at a time when we need that type of flexibility to help ordinary Californians. And that inflexibility on the regulations is particularly kind of problematic. I mean, 
cutting the regulatory burden, which is a huge cost on businesses across the state, if we could actually get a reprieve from those costs, what a great way to help the economy recover, again, bring in more income, bring in more tax revenues, all of these positive things that we want to see. Uh, and you're cutting regulations so you wouldn't actually be costing government. So it's a fantastic AB5 energy regulations, lowering all of these burdens, occupational licensing, we could actually help the economy recover without actually costing a dime in tax revenues. I think you guys have agreed with me in a sense that it's still sort of California business as usual, isn't it? Yeah. And also, too, on that point, Wayne, on minimum wage, you know, the next dollar increase in the minimum wage, I think, takes effect July 1st. And there's provisions in California's minimum wage law where the governor could suspend or delay the dollar increase based on economic conditions in the state. And if now is not a time where economic conditions have deteriorated, where we should be suspending that law, I don't know when would be. I 100% agree. Lance, you've written a lot about the growth in online education during the COVID-19 crisis. It's unknown when schools will actually reopen and whether they will continue to do some of their schooling at home during the, the next school year. Should preparing to expand online education be more of a budget priority? And how should we reprioritize current spending to ensure that we are properly funding the training, resources, and, and infrastructure needed to help every student learn online? Well, thanks, Ro. Well, several years ago, I co-authored a book called Moonshots in Education for PRI, and I detailed in that book how America's teacher corps was actually woefully unprepared for the online education revolution. And that book was certainly prescient given uh, what we are living through right now and, you know, living through the consequences of that crucial oversight. Uh, a recent analysis by the University of Washington system found that most school districts have not been able to pivot to online distance learning. In my Moonshots in Education book, I analyze how countries uh, now ranging from Singapore to Korea uh, to China to others have deeply embedded instruction in online teaching methods into their teacher training programs. So, for example, in Singapore, they have an e-learning week every year where all teaching and learning throughout the country is done online. Singapore can do that because they have created a teacher training program for teachers so that they have the skills they need to be able to teach all these kids through online methods. But in California, our state and uh, higher education and school districts, you know, haven't done that. And we need to redirect the dollars we invest in them to improve teacher competency in online education. Uh, even though the May revise eliminates some proposed teacher training dollars, there's still funding available for professional development. So in this COVID era, to be effective, teachers need to be competent in online instruction. And the districts need to be able to focus their attention and their dollars to these professional development uh, new realities so that they are able to address the needs of the kids in the situation they're in right now, which is they're homebound and, uh, you know, are learning mostly through online means. And the other thing I, I'd point out is that, you know, recent polling is showing that four out of 10 parents are actually thinking of continuing to educate their children at home even after the schools are reopened. So if education dollars follow the child, as I had mentioned earlier, the parents would uh, be able to use those dollars to purchase things such as computer hardware, Wi-Fi connection, and other online programs to support the needs of their children through homeschooling. So again, we're going to have to have that flexibility to be able to address the new normal. And, you know, unfortunately, up till now, uh, California government and its leaders seem incapable of uh, that type of flexibility. Wayne, one of your big research topics in your Beyond the New Normal series has been America's growing debt and encouraging policymakers at every level of government to enact the optimum government spending level to maximize economic growth. Now, even though Governor Newsom is proposing to cut spending due to falling revenue, isn't California still spending too much? Yes, it is. And one of the things we were trying to put out there with this concept of uh, an affordable level of government is an idea of just like any other good that we would consume, that public services has a, a right amount of spending. So if you think about like mortgages, right, if you're going to go and get a mortgage, there's these rule of thumbs that says about 20 
25% of your gross income should be the amount that you spend on your mortgage. If you're spending less than that, then it's an affordable mortgage. More than that, uh, and it's uh, unaffordable. California, side note, uh, we tend to have unaffordable mortgages. That's a different issue. Our point is that government spending has the exact same logic, that there's an amount of government spending that's affordable. And so when you spend more than that, you actually detract from growth. Now, in California, we've had a huge reduction in our budget, right? Because of coronavirus, it's fallen about 9%, but income is falling just as much. If you believe Morgan Stanley's projection, we could see nearly a 40% drop in the second quarter's level of economic activity. Uh, just uh, recently, retail sales data came out. That's dropped 17%. We're talking about huge double-digit declines in our income. So even though we've dropped government spending, that drop in government spending has been less on a percentage basis than the drops that we are probably experiencing on our income. So when you look at affordability, government is still uh, not affordable. A lot of this gets to these long-term structural issues. Uh, it's very difficult to deal with these in a crisis. That's why it was so important that we, we get spending control when times are good. This didn't happen. Now we have our short-term issues you know, piling on top of our long-term issues. And a lesson that we need to take from going through this budget crisis right now is that we need to, when we get to a stable position, start addressing these longer-term issues, whether it's overall spending levels, pensions, debt levels, whatever the case may be, we got to get our fiscal house in order. You know, I, just as an example, in terms of, you know, the importance of dealing with, you know, structural issues, I mean, in my, in my education area, for example, if you look just at a, a large school district like Los Angeles Unified School District, six out of 10 of their dollars is actually spent on just three items. You know, you're talking about salaries, special education, uh, and retirement benefit. And so, you know, already you have a m vast majority of your dollars, you know, restricted basically to paying off just those three things with, you know, relatively little left over to actually influence other factors that actually improve student performance. And so, you know, if, uh, unless those things are dealt with, I mean, I agree with Wayne, it's harder to deal with them necessarily in the um, short term. But unless those sorts of uh, structural problems are uh, dealt with, then you're never going to see the bang for your buck that we want from our tax dollars. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, when we hear about budget numbers, we often hear about just large aggregate numbers. We don't know where those monies go to, you know, which is why I mentioned previously, you know, how important it is under something like the governor, the governor's local control funding formula that, uh, you know, we understand where that money is going to uh, at school districts and to see whether, you know, those students are actually benefiting from the way the uh, districts are spending their money. Here's a question for Carrie. Uh, state and local governments will surely turn to tax increases to help them balance the budget. Now, before 2020, this might have been a good bet because voters have historically uh, approved them. However, uh, this year, just 53% of local sales tax measures were approved in the March primary and about 35% of parcel tax measures. So I, I read in the new budget that there may be some planned uh, increases in, in cigarette taxes. Do you think that voters will be in, a, in the mood to approve tax increases this November, uh, even to save popular programs that they might benefit from? Well, I don't even try to figure out what kind of mood the voters are going to be in six months from now. If that had to be my job, I would not. I would starve to death. I, I just you know, I have no feeling necessarily for that, that kind of prediction. But what I do have a little feeling of maybe this is a clue that we're seeing that if we're looking to who is the most vocal, the most outraged Californians in the last tired of being unshut down or being locked down, they're going out, they're protesting, they're getting, they're they're angry, they're expressing their anger. So I, I think it might be interesting to see how when the fall election does roll around or elections roll around, how this may translate to voting. You know, will they still be, I don't want to say anti-government, but will that frustration spill over and then you can see you know, I, again, I don't call it an anti-government wave, but maybe a wave of voters who are not ready for more government. They have seen the limits of unlimited government, and they don't like what they see. If Sacramento were smart, uh, it would pursue tax reform. It wouldn't go after tax hikes. Uh, I, I think that, uh, and new taxes as well. This system, as Wayne had mentioned, is, is quite volatile. And you have your boom and bust in the economy, then you have your boom and bust in revenue. So uh, what the system, what we need is a system that, A, will certainly promote economic growth and the system is in place now, the tax system won't. I'm speaking mostly of the income tax system. Sorry, the base needs to be wider and rates need to be flat or flatter 
at least, and they need to be low. Uh, this is what San Clemente should be looking at. This is maybe what the locals should be looking at. I shouldn't say maybe this is what they should be look, looking at, too. Uh, there's a, a big hole that's been dug through these lockdowns through this pandemic, and unless there's some changes in the tax systems, it's going to make it just that much harder to dig out. You know, I, I'd add on, on to that, Kerry, uh, is that if you look at some of the recent votes that uh, have gone on, uh, even before all of this uh, COVID crisis occurred when the economy was really humming along. And yet you saw, for example, in Los Angeles after the teacher strike down there, that uh, voters by a significant margin voted down the parcel tax increase there, a proposal. And also, too, the, uh, the state education bond went down to defeat. And so I think that, you know, when you look at those uh, votes, and again, those occurred uh, during, you know, times of economic upturn. You know, when you have this massive downturn that we're experiencing now, it's very difficult for me to see how that same electorate is going to now decide that we need to increase taxes, especially when most of them, well, a significant portion of them are without jobs, their businesses have collapsed, and, uh, you know, they don't see that uh, their future is going to be getting any better for the near term. And it would seem to me that it's the wrong environment to propose a tax increase. Well, I certainly agree with that. The environment is wrong. You know, I saw the same things you did and stories about how it looks like the trend or the the way things are going in California and in other states, too. But, uh, you know, people are fed up with taxes, so they're they're coming out against them. And I believe the the fact that uh, it was, we just we read was 53 percent of local sales tax measures were only 53 uh, percent were improved in March. And I, I still want to I guess I'm too cynical, but I still want to see one more cycle to see if there is a real a trend in effect. If it's going in the way that you know, we, as as uh, folks who believe in limited government, would like to see it go, so you know, let's. I, I'm I'm I don't know if I'm optimistic, but I, I do want to see what happens, and then, as I say, give it, give it one more cycle to see if there's there's really going to be a trend there. And I think it's also incumbent upon those of us who feel that it's important to have limited government to emphasize it when these tax proposals come up. You know, what what the advocates of big government always do is they take all of the wasteful spending and they kind of you know, sweep that under the rug and they showcase the things that the, the, the government should be doing and it should be doing well. Uh, and they say, hey, look, if, if you don't vote for these taxes, we're, we're going to cut those things that you, you really want. That's what we were talking about earlier. And I think it's incumbent upon us to lift up the rug and shine the light on all the things they're trying to hide. Obviously, there's important things that the state government does and you should be doing those better because you're not doing those well, but do what you should be doing well. And these, these are the areas that we should be focusing on cutting as opposed to going to the pockets of people who are suffering economically and across the board we're all suffering for them to to ask for more money that that that's just uh absolutely the wrong economically and almost morally to say look we're going to keep wasting your money we're going to take more of it so we can waste more of it in these difficult times I'm curious at the end of the day to see, is the COVID-19 fueled budget crisis, what's going to push Californians over the edge to approve the mega of all tax battles that's coming this November, and that's over the split roll property tax scheme? You know, Californians have a history of approving tax increases, even controversial ones, when someone else is paying the tax. And clearly, you know, the proponents of this measure are going to push it as corporations not paying their fair share, but also now in this environment of popular programs facing significant budget cuts, it's an easy campaign to run to say, if you want an easy way to generate $11 billion in new revenue every year to save cuts to the programs you like, vote for the split roll measure. Gavin Newsom was asked that the other day in his uh, budget press conference, and maybe that's what the uh, how he'll pivot in the trigger cut battle when Trump inevitably turns down Gavin's request for a bailout, pass split roll or have these trigger cuts? Pass your split roll would be just deadly. I, I can't imagine using any other word to be more descriptive of what would happen on that. We have an owners of industrial and, and particularly commercial properties that are just being crushed right now by the lockdown. And to add to their burden or make them pay something that they simply can't pay, uh, that's that's foolish. When you look at keeping, the only thing keeping taxes competitive in California is Prop 13 and property taxes. If that if that damn falls, uh, it, it, it'll, it'll be uh, a, a huge increase in tax burden. And the net migration that we've seen out of California is going to turn from a, a into a, a much bigger flow. 
when you think about, you know, when that split roll measure was first proposed, and again, you know, California's economy was really humming along, you know, you could uh, think that their strategy would be let somebody else pay for the cost of this, the businesses, but mo- most of those businesses are, you know, in extremely dire straits. I mean, we've seen all sorts of uh, closure signs on, you know, businesses all throughout this state. So it's hard to imagine that you're going to not only impose this shutdown order on businesses, but they also then top it all off with increasing their uh, tax burden as well. I mean, that would be certainly the kiss of death for them if they haven't received it already. You know, I I'm, I'm, I agree with you, Lance. It, that, I'm wondering if the, um, Californians would uh, have a little bit more empathy to the businesses who employ them and perhaps vote this down. I think, you know, in the past years, obviously, California had a, a good economy, but this year it's obviously that everybody's going to struggle. So hopefully voters will think twice about voting these this uh, these tax increases. Well, let's close with a question for all of our panelists. Even though the budget will be passed by June 15, really so legislators can keep getting their paychecks, a lot of work remains. You know, tax day is now July 15th, and we're going to get a better picture of our revenue situation then, even though all parties now say the fiscal situation is such that they need to pass a tough budget now, not a quote, baseline budget. We're going to see more budget changes inevitably down the road. So given all these uncertainties, how realistic do you think the governor's budget is for the times that we face? And will legislative Democrats really line up behind the governor to enact billions in budget cuts? Well, I'll start answering with a question. And when is the last time does anybody think we've had a a realistic budget out of Sacramento? And my short answer on the other question is... uh, I don't know if they're going to be more eagerly lining up, but I, I, I think that they're going to probably give him the support he needs. Again, I would go back to what I said earlier. I wouldn't want to make a living at uh, predicting votes from voters or in, in uh, policy making decisions. But that's uh, that's again, maybe I'll go back to what I also said, too. Maybe I'm just too, too cynical. I've grown too cynical. <laughs> P- pulling out my inner Bill Clinton, it depends on the definition of realistic. We have right now, if you look at the actual numbers that he's put out there, the governor's put out there. Uh, put out there. They they match up and we needed those cuts. And so wonderful. That seems realistic. The question is through the political process, is this what we're going to get? And given the super duper majority that exists in the state house, I I don't think it's realistic that we're going to see a 10% cut uh, in the the budget when it all is said and done. Uh, It just seems very antithetical to what they want to do. And they're going to have the excuse of oh, if you do that, it's going to be bad for the economy. And they're going to kind of latch onto that. And they're going to go through, whether it's, you know, by crook, whether it's pressure on the federal government, whether it's gamesmanship to push tax increases uh, in, in the fall and have those votes and, you know, push the decision that way. They don't want to cut the budget 10 percent and they will do everything in their power not to. No, I, I think that's right, Wayne. Uh, you know, I also think that uh, looking at in Washington, I mean, I don't see uh, that uh, the Republicans, for example, are in any mood to uh, bail out blue states like California for the spending decisions they've made throughout all these years. I think also, too, that, I mean, the big question mark down the road, I mean, not that far down the road, is like, you know, how many more uh, companies are there like Elon Musk who are going to take their companies out of state because, you know, they're not, uh, we're not opening up. There's no sign that we're opening up and there's no interest in, in opening up amongst our top leaders. And so, you know, why should they stay here and go bankrupt when, you know, they can go to Georgia or Florida or Texas or someplace else, you know, and, and, uh, and open up their plants and uh, their businesses. So, I mean, that's, of course, going to have a huge impact on uh, the revenues that California takes in uh, in the coming months. You know, whatever the projections that are going to be coming in about those revenues, I mean, you know, I, I think they are going to probably be very problematic because of uh, not just the closures in the state, but also, too, about, you know, the uh, migration of uh, companies and businesses out of the state. Thanks so much, everyone. Special thanks to Tim Anaya, Lance Azumi, Carrie Jackson, and Wayne Weingarten. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to our podcast on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Itchon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.